Welcome everybody to episode one of a uh, chess themed podcast with myself, Christian Kirilla, and I'm Fabiano Caruana. So what? what's up, Christian? Well, not so much, Fabi. Uh, it's first of all great um, to finally start a podcast, a chess podcast. I know that um, there's a lot of uh, podcasts out there, but I wanted to bring our own uh, tune to the mix. And I think, uh, yeah, I'm excited about that. So that's uh, the first thing. How about yourself, Fabio? Well, I'm back in the States after it's been a while at your home. It's good to be here. You know, it's my first time in uh, visiting here. And uh, yeah, it's been an interesting few months. Played a lot of chess, which is pretty cool, but also a bit difficult at times. My home uh, here, uh, we are not going to mention the location because those uh, crazy fans, who knows, <laughs> maybe they will uh, track me down. So you're back in the States. You've been away for uh, quite a few months, actually. You were in Europe for a very long time. When's the last time you were uh, in the States? Well, I played the American Cup. I think that ended about the end of April. Mm -hmm. And then I immediately flew over to Europe and started the Grand Chess Tour. And that was a series of tournaments which ended with the Olympiad before I came back to the States. And that included the candidates tournament. So it was a very busy few months of chess, it included a lot of training as well. Um, but yeah, everything which has to do with the candidates is very intense, of course. Uh, there's a huge amount of preparation with that and stress that comes with it. And while well, the chess will start again soon, it seems these days that chess is pretty much never ending. There's always a tournament to watch, even when I'm not playing. I know that there's like, you know, three, four tournaments going on with top players at any moment. So not just as a chess player, but also as a chess fan, there's a lot to watch and a lot to talk about. The chess pretty much never ends. And you were mentioning that there was a lot of training going into the candidates. And I know how that goes because we had so many camps in preparation for the 2018 candidates. Uh, tell us a bit about uh, the 2020 candidates. You change a few things up. How many camps did you have? How do those camps look like in general? Yeah, well, you mentioned the 2018 cycle uh, where we worked together. We started with the training before the candidates. And for me, it's interesting because I've, I've played a lot of these uh, candidates tournaments and I'm always doing it a bit differently, trying different things, trying to improve it. But sometimes it goes less or more successfully. You never know what will work out. I think what we did in 2018, not just for the candidates, but also for the world championship because I qualified for that. I think what we did then was extremely successful. Um, we, we arranged it pretty well. We also had, you know, I guess some good, you know, momentum because of what happened at the candidates. It was very successful. There's always some luck involved with that, but that really carried us forward for some good training. Um, this time, of course, I did it quite a bit differently. Um, and not only that, not only this year, but also the 2020, I, I guess, Maybe we should start with that one because that one was such a weird candidates, right? You had like two parts of the candidates and nobody actually knew what was going to happen next. Um, how did you approach that? Yeah, that was particularly crazy. And the thing is, we planned the training for that candidate, candidates. And then like halfway through, you know, we had heard about the coronavirus, right. like early <laughs> January, February. And the candidates, just to remind uh, our listeners was uh, in March. So it was right around, you know, right when it peaked and right when the world went to shutdown mode. And we started to get a hint of that when we were in a preparation. And was that in January? Because I think when we were uh, training for the candidates, that's when we did our last camp in January. Yeah, this was a little bit later because I played the um, Vikings A tournament Tata Steel, yeah. in 2020. Yeah, the Tata Steel tournament. And then we started training in Spain. And around halfway through, we had already heard about the coronavirus, but we weren't sure about the severity of it or what would happen. And then we started getting some emails and some correspondence back and forth with FIDE and also with other players from the tournament. And um, of course, there were like very far reaching consequences for the tournament because one of the players dropped out because of that, uh, Tamor Rajabov. He said, I think the candidates should be either postponed um, or, you know, we should think about a, a different time to do it because this is happening. And, you know, I, I agreed with him at the time. Um, I, I thought that, like, with travel especially and the fact that people are coming from so many places and, like, the consequences of this are a little bit hard to predict. Do you remember that, how that discussion first started? So it was Timur, 
who uh, brought this up and then who took the final decision to uh, keep the tournament going? Well, this was, I think FIDE mismanaged this a bit because they uh, didn't like include all the players in t into one discussion, but they had separate discussions with each player. So we raised our concerns with FIDE and they said, no, 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 everything's going to be fine. And Tamor raised his concerns and I assume they told the same thing to him. Uh, and then at some point they told everyone, well, Tamor decided to drop out. And that means that Maxime Vashilagrav is going to replace him as he was, I think, the third place in the Grand Prix cycle yeah. that time. And I, I think, think was... he was also a pretty popular pick from for the fans. The, the yeah. fans were yeah, definitely yeah. asking for him. Definitely a totally deserving player in the candidates. Um, but of course, it is it does shake the tournament up a lot because um, everyone's expecting this one guy to be in and then another guy comes in. And also for him, it's like he had no idea that he would be playing and then suddenly they're like... Okay, you're in. <laughs> Go to Russia now, and uh, so that was that was very interesting. I, I think that they should have postponed the tournament, and that's what they ended up doing. But it just ended up being a mess because, of course, it's better to postpone it before round one than after round seven, which is what what happened. And there was a very interesting um, kind of discussion that was had before the tournament. Uh, once everyone was in Russia, we started to get some news, and I won't say from Hugh, but from who, but. Uh, we started to hear that maybe the tournament would be postponed after round seven, mm. specifically halfway through the tournament. And we heard this before the first round, and we were like, well, you know, we're already in Russia. It was very difficult to get here because, like, half our flights were canceled, and we had to rebook everything, and we had to go through these empty airports and wind up in Moscow with, like, people in hazmat suits, <laughs> which is totally nuts. And so we were like, okay. Uh, you know, now that we're here, let's start the tournament and see what happens. Yeah. And as everyone knows, of course, it was all postponed after round seven. It was so eerie because I remember, um, I think it was before round number seven, as you were mentioning. Um, I was doing, I was helping with um, the St. Louis Chess Club's broadcast and I was uh, recording some game reviews and I was doing them uh, during the night. And then I checked Twitter occasionally right while i was uh, preparing the game reviews and i saw that somebody one of the journalists was just saying that yeah the candidates was postponed and i was like holy smokes <laughs> here we go yep so yeah one year later i guess we we, we got the second uh, second round of the candidates but let's move on to the to the last one you take us through that how uh, how did you guys prepare how did you guys uh feel going in the candidates like, how was the experience? Yeah, I think the preparation was pretty serious. It included a bunch of uh, camps and preparation devoted to players. As I assume, I, I think everyone has the same sort of general approach, which is to think about their openings, their strategy, look at the opponents, try to get in shape, make sure that you're not, you know, rusty or yeah. blundering things or hallucinating variations. Uh, but there's a lot of nerves, and I, I felt a lot of nerves before the tournament. And I think possibly I you know, overworked, overtrained a bit mm. um, because it was, yeah, it was like work that pretty much led up straight to the tournament. And nerves more than you usually feel or because obviously with every competition you have nerves, right? Well, and as a professional, you kind of learn how to manage those. But even though you know how to manage those and you have a lot of experience going into the event two, three days ahead of the event, you still have the butterflies, right? Yeah, I, I don't think you can remove those. I mean, any like high stakes event. And if you don't have any nerves, yeah. that's a bad sign. That's a bad sign. That yeah. means either you don't care or you're so scared. Well, I don't know why anyone wouldn't care. Or you're just like so scared that you're going to fail that your body is in like shutdown mode. And let's like preserve. Let's make sure that we don't have any trauma. Yeah. So like you, you know, you're telling yourself, I'm not going to succeed. So let's not put any nerves on it. And that's a very bad thing. So some nerves are good. Uh, I wasn't worried about that, that I was a bit nervy. Um, you know, in hindsight, it was just my energy levels, which I should have been worried about. And, you know, I was trying to get in physical shape, which is what you do to preserve your energy. But, um, yeah, it's not sometimes it's not just physical energy, but it's also nervous energy. And, yeah. um, and with such a long event and a lot of emotions, uh, and certainly there's always a lot of emotions in these events, yeah, you know, like in, in 2018, um, I also had ups and downs, but I handled it better. And this time just didn't handle it too well. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, the end of the tournament was a complete disaster. There was no like way to sugarcoat it. It was 
the worst thing that could have happened, especially in hindsight, knowing that second place would have been enough? Actually, that, 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 that's a good question. Did you ever think during the event that second best, uh, second place would be good enough or were you just like focused on grabbing first? Well, I was only focused on first, but of course there were always these thoughts that you know, maybe second maybe. is enough, but yeah. you can't play for second. Like, let's say once I had achieved plus three in the tournament and Jan was plus four and I had tried to go and go into like full, like risk Catch averse mode. mode. Yeah which is yeah. still difficult to do, but let's say I had gone in that mode and and achieved it and like finished second with like plus three and Jan got plus five. Uh, and then like Magnus says, well, I'm going to play. Right. Then you also feel kind of stupid, you know? Like, yeah, I, I needed to take my chances because who cares if I'm second or, or sixth place. Um, so it, yeah, in hindsight, it would have been, uh, mm. <laughs> been a very good idea, but I didn't know that at the time. And yeah, I think I could have gone into that like into that mode after I lost to Ikaru. Um, that was round seven or eight? Uh, that was round eight. And round then I eight. drew Jan. And okay, of course, I was trying to beat Jan and uh, didn't manage it. But th like that game really shook me up because not because I like spoiled the advantage, but because I, I blundered something which was extremely... Um, was that the one where you were white or black? You that was white. the one. Yeah, I played him in the, with black in the second round. And then with white... You got a better position with black as well. Yeah. Yeah, in both both games, I got good positions out of the opening. The the second round one, I was even objectively winning. Um, I didn't realize that. And in the the uh, ninth game, I I knew that I was much better, but I couldn't find the way. But well, I thought I found the way, mm. but I, I hallucinated something in the in the variations, and you know, not to get into not to get into any of the chess details, but uh, it was a very very silly blunder, and even more so and people like didn't think about this because it looked like I just spoiled advantage and made a draw. Right. But at some point I was getting super low on time and also getting a worse position. And I started to think, well, this is going to be the stupidest thing ever. Not only did I spoil a safe and <laughs> big advantage, but now I might even lose this game. Um, so that takes a toll on you, right? Like psychologically, yeah, yeah, yeah. energy I, wise. Yeah, for sure. I was very shaky at that moment. So I, I kind of felt that, but then I also wanted to beat Duda with black. I was thinking like, I kind of have to win this game. So it was like my, my mindset was all over the place at that moment. That was the game where I felt that, yeah, you're probably right now out of com uh, contention for the first after yeah. you lost to Duda. Because at that point, it still felt that if you string a couple of vi victories together, then you will be just fine. But that loss with, with, with the black pieces, and I remember also you were, uh, it, it felt like you were quite disappointed looking on the camera and seeing everything that was happening. Yeah. Um, did you feel that way as well, or were you still within contention in your mind? Well, like mentally, I kind of gave up after I lost to Duda. Duda, yeah. Because I felt like I, there's no way to get first anymore. It's, it's too much of a gap. And I didn't feel like second would amount to anything still. Um, you know, my coach was telling me, well, still got to play for second because there's still a chance. And yeah. in hindsight, of course, he was 100% right. And so I, I, that's what I was trying to do. And then against Ding, I got like a huge advantage, but this was just like, okay, that's where I really lost my chances to qualify. Because if I had, even if I had just drawn that game, mm. I would still been been in contention. I would have been tied with Ding and who knows? It was uh, two rounds to go. It was such a wild event. Yeah. Like Rajabov after the first half, it felt like he will probably end up last. And then he uh, strung together a couple of victories and then he was almost within like half a points from uh, qualification, right? It yeah. was just wild. Yeah. I mean, once second place opens up, yeah. this is such a rare, I think, unheard of occurrence. Yeah. Um, I Yeah, I can't even like remember going back in chess history when this, when this happened. Um, once second place opens up, like anything is possible. Mm. Um, but the thing is like we were only thinking, and I think most people were still thinking this, that it's like first place or bust. And that was my mindset. So I was thinking, okay, everyone's behind like... Jan is on plus four at some point, like halfway through the tournament. Ding is minus one. This guy's minus one. That guy's minus one. It's only like, only I can really catch up to him. That was my feeling. And it was it, kind of true because he did run away with it. And I was the only one who, at least like if I had strung a few wins together, I was in striking distance. Um, but yeah, that, that we could have been playing for a second. That's a whole other story. Mm. And know, I have to ask you, like, what's... 
how did you approach Magnus's uh, decision? And when were you sure that his decision was final? Did you think about the decision too much going into the event and during the event as well? And do you feel like Magnus's decision was fair? Well, fair. I mean, it's his choice. You know, you can't uh, you can't tell him you have to do something. I, I guess let me rephrase that. Fair to let you guys play the tournament first and then tell you the decision. Well, I think he said it in a strange way, which was that I'll play against Ali Reza, uh -huh. which to me is strange because if you don't want to play world championship match, I fully understand, you know. But he, did he say that? Did he actually name kind of, Ali Reza? Or? Yeah, that's kind of what he said. Um yeah, he more he like he didn't say definitively like I won't play against anyone, but he was like I probably won't play unless it's Ferruja. Right. And yeah, I mean, okay, it would be fun to play against Ferruja. I mean, he's a, he's an interesting player. He's a the leader of the new generation. Um but he's not like stronger than any of the other players in the tournament. I mean, you that know, was shown everyone the candidates. Yeah, but but just generally. I mean, of course some, you know, we have like rises and falls and we've seen a lot of players 2800 2780 2800 again um like all these players are capable at that level you know we might see duda in six months mm. 2800 right mm. so uh it's not like ali reza was head and shoulders above everyone else and that's i think pretty clear now right uh of course he's a very strong player and i think anyone in the who won the candidates would be worthy of a match against magnus like would be a worthy competitor uh but to say, like, I'll only play against him, it's like, but why? Right. I didn't really understand it. So that's why I didn't take what he was saying so much to heart. Because I thought, it kind of sounds like he's messing with people, you know? Um, that's just the way I took it. If he had said, I just don't want to play the match, and that's that, then we'd be like, okay, maybe he really is sick and tired of playing a, you know, 12-game, 14-game series of uh, series against the same person. I understand it. it can get a bit monotonous and maybe he wants to uh, spearhead a change of format mm. as, as he said, like incorporate more rapid, more blitz, whatever. Um, again, I, I don't have like any special insight besides what he's said publicly. Uh, but I, I also understand, you know, you were there and you know how stressful Taxing. Yeah. the yeah. match is uh, where any mistake is like the difference between being world champion or Dude, I grew white hair after uh, <laughs> that World Championship match. That was just insane. And I think we all lost at least 10 pounds during the event. You probably lost way more. Like, I was watching you every single day going into the championship rounds, and I was feeling, and I'm sure Rustam was feeling the same type of emotions that I was, which was just immense pressure. And I was just, like, wondering, how does this guy, feel right now in uh, these moments and i can only imagine it was like 10 times the amount of pressure that i was uh feeling so yeah it just takes a toll on you um as you know the champion as well you're risking a lot every single time mm -hmm. you put your uh, championship on the line so i understand his decision at the same time um i i i, I couldn't believe it i couldn't believe my eyes i i woke up we were just supposed to do a commentary um in St. Louis for uh, the, the, the candidates. I think it was maybe before round seven or something along those lines. And um, uh, we just found out, I think Alejandro was the one that told me that, uh, yeah, Magnus is out. It's it's a completely uh, a new feeling in the chess world. Everybody was completely shocked at that point. It just felt like it was a historical moment. And I couldn't believe it for um, uh, the initial day. But later on, I started understanding his kind of train of thought. Obviously, the pressure that you were mentioning and uh, not wanting to deal with that. Um, also, you're basically just losing, what, like six months out of your life on, on preparation for every single um, match. You're secluding yourself from society for like six months alongside your training partner. So that takes a toll on yeah. anybody. Well, it's it's also a matter of perspective. Are you seeing it as like chess preparation devoted to one specific goal, which it is? Yeah. But it's also general chess preparation to enhance yourself as a player. But but the guy is uh, you know multiple time world champion. He's over thirty now. He's thirty two years old, I think. Yeah. Um, he's probably probably feels like he's accomplished basically everything there is to accomplish, and that's true. Mm. And so he doesn't have to prove himself. So the question is, does he care so much about the extra payday? And I guess he's he's not hurting for the money, 
So he probably doesn't factor that in so much. Mm. Um, so maybe he thinks, well, why do I have to play the same guy again when I already proved that, that I beat him in a match? Um, but actually, the, the question of pressure is an interesting one, more oh, generally. Yeah. Because I've heard this like theory espoused by, by some people who, who kind of know the chess world very well. And they think that chess players are psychopaths. Sure. Because they can handle <laughs> the pressure. Yeah. Well, I, and I was thinking about it For because, like, is that a sign that something is different about, like, if you can handle that level of pressure, is that a sign that there's something difficult, uh, different, different about you as a person? And we see this not just in chess, but other sports, you know, like boxers who go in and they know that they have to... Any top level sport, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. That the, not just the amount of like prestige is on the line, the money is on the line, and also you're in front of the eyes of the world and, right. and they're going to judge you depending on, they're going to judge you either well, if you, you know, if you prove you're a champion or they're going to judge you very harshly if you don't, uh, don't succeed or you know, lose the match or, or the tournament, whatever it is. That's an interesting angle. Now you're talking about pressure and you could make the case that let's say as a chess player, the pressure is more prominent because it's a mental game. You always have to think about the game. Now, at the same time, um, for a boxing match, sure, it's a lot of uh, mental, but also it's also physical, right? So, but at the same time, for a boxing match, you also have hundreds of uh, millions of eyes watching you. Maybe for a world championship match, we're still more or less, the chess is still, it feels like a niche game at mm -hmm. least, right? Uh, from a spectator's point of view. So which one adds more pressure? I guess my question is the amount of money that you're making, the amount of money that it's on the line, the eyes watching you, or is it just this mental aspect that chess definitely has uh, in comparison to other sports? Well, I don't think it's money so much because, of course, the money is nice and it's good to secure a good living and, and be comfortable. Right. But, the, you know, getting your name in the history books, that's a big thing for a lot of people. Yeah. And to prove that you're one of the greatest in the history of something, whether it be chess or tennis or boxing. And although, let's say, tennis or boxing are, are you know, physical sports, um, I mean, the mental aspect behind them is so huge. It's immense, yeah. It's uh, the same way that people sometimes underestimate the physical side of chess. I think you can also underestimate the mental side, the mental, you know, toughness that the great champions like in tennis. Mm. I mean, like you watch Nadal and you're like, this guy never gives up no matter what, because people could give up when they're exhausted, when they're injured, but, but the guy pretty much never will give up a single point. And, uh, and that's amazing. That's what makes the champions, of course. No, absolutely. I mean, he's uh, down like two sets and a game and he still uh, manages to come back against the best. It's just ridiculous. Uh, yeah, that's basically what champions are made of. Now, um, talk to me a bit about Nepo. Uh, this was huge in my eyes. And to be honest, every pundit that I was hearing in uh, preparation for the candidates did not consider Nepo as a uh, favorite to win it, even though he was coming from the match with ridiculous preparation, right? Because when, whenever you're preparing for a match, you have an army of seconds looking at things for you. And uh, that residual preparation stays with you for a very long time. Still, not a lot of pundits. And I think even Gary Kasparov was like, yeah, yeah, um, I did not consider Nepo a favorite. Did you look at Nepo as a favorite at all? I think everyone underestimated him, yeah. which we know how capable he is. But the the way that he lost the match, I think kind of gave so people that's an the idea. Why. Yeah, that's I think that's why. that's part of it. It's a, it's like an emotional response to something terrible happening. Like, you know, you see someone lose in such a dramatic fashion, you're like, this is going to destroy them. Right. And it's impressive that he came back. I think it was also compounded a bit by how he played this uh, Romania uh, Grand Chess Tour event, and it, it looked like he didn't care during the games. He didn't play well. He was like he was kind of just throwing his pieces around. Um, like playing very carelessly, yeah. and it was it didn't give an impression of a guy who's you know about to win the biggest tournament in the world, and and I also got messages like during the event like, well you know Jan he's don't worry I mean he's gonna he's gonna fuck it up at some point right um, and okay I, I I during the tournament I was thinking well I mean once Jan gets going he can get super dangerous this is like really really dangerous the guy can can start racking up wins. And you never know how that's going to turn out. 
So I was very worried. That's why, like, especially when he beat, um, he beat Richie. He beat Rapport. Well, he started off with the the win against Ding, right? Yeah. With the black pieces. That mm -hmm. was huge. That was great for him. That that gave him a lot of good emotions going forward. And then he won with black against Richie in round seven. Yeah. And that game really, like, it kind of tilted me a bit. Even though I also won my game, I was like, I'm doing great. But somehow <laughs> I'm not, like, catching up to this guy. Yeah. And it was it was frustrating. And um, so, yeah, the, once he gets going, he's one of the most dangerous players. Because he, like, he thrives on confidence a lot. Mm. Uh, he has the ability to play like perfectly, mm -hmm. but not only to play perfectly, but also to put a lot of pressure because he plays very quickly and confidently. And that's psychologically difficult to handle. Um, so if if he kind of like hits that wall, then it could be difficult for him because one loss, yeah, one loss. It almost felt like it was all it takes going into that second uh, part of the candidates in twenty twenty when he lost against MVL, and then everything shut down. I think that was a blessing for him pretty much. Now, this same situation did not happen during the recent candidates, right? He just kept going. He didn't lose a single game. He saved some pretty bad positions uh, as well. Do you feel that was um, like a mixture of luck and just confidence as, as a whole? Well, I, I don't like to call it luck because luck is so such an important factor in winning tournaments. Yeah. Like... I don't even know if you can call it luck. It's, it's just circumstance. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, you know, if you don't get any momentum going, if your opponents just play perfectly, you can't win a game. Like, you need your opponents to make mistakes to win games, and you need them to make mistakes if you're in trouble, and you're going to be in trouble at some point. So to call it luck, I mean, I don't know if I'd say that. Like, there's things that I would call lucky in, like, my career, which people don't even notice because it's behind the scenes. Like, one example is... Um, 2018 candidates, I lose to Sergei Karyakin in round 12. I was a point ahead of me before that. After that, he's in the lead because mm -hmm. at that time there was there was no playoff in case of a tie. There was a tie break based on direct encounter. He beats me. He pulls ahead by direct encounter. Now I have to score better than him in the last two games. Mm. And I'm playing Levon in round 13. And I'm white. And Levon plays two openings, or he did at that time. He, Of course, since then, lots happened. He's played a ton of openings. But at that time, he was a Marshall player and a Berlin player. Mm. And we had a good idea in the Marshall in the opening. We're like confident about this, get an interesting position, get a game, get a fight. In the Berlin, nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Not a single idea of what to do. And it was just 50-50. If he plays the Berlin, I will not get anything from the opening. And I really doubt that I'm going to win that game. Right. 50-50, he plays a marshal, I win the game, and I pull into the lead, and I win the tournament the round later. That's just like, to me, that's luck. Probability. Yeah. But to the outside viewer, it's like, what, he played an opening, what do you mean luck, right? right? But this is like behind the scenes stuff. That So I don't know if you can call it luck or just circumstances that work in your favor. So yeah, Jan had some had some things going in his favor. Starting mm -hmm. from the first round, Ding loses with White, it's a rare occurrence. You know, Richie loses with White in, uh, in round seven, it's a rare occurrence. These things, but you're, all your opponents play perfectly, and you look like you know you can't win a game. All the guys on chess bomb or <laughs> chess bomb doesn't exist anymore, but whatever they're saying, they're calling not chess bomb they're calling you uh, you know <laughs> draw whatever, yeah. and uh, and that's how it goes. But you win a few games, and and things go well for you. That's just how chess works. No, absolutely. And um, another incredible story from the candidates was. That of uh, Ding, yeah, we all counted him out. Like we were in St. Louis as well as everybody else, every other pundit out there, uh, watching his games in the first half, and we're like, yeah, he's out, definitely out. It's a reiteration of basically what happened in 2020 for him. And then he starts s stringing up victories out of nowhere, one after the other, and then he gets closer and closer. Not necessarily to Nepo, right? Because Nepo, we already understood that he's most likely running away with the event. But we were also kind of starting to understand that maybe Magnus actually is serious about this uh, whole not playing uh, around thing. And then you had Naka, then you had Ding, then you had yourself as well who were in contention. Um, what's wh What do you think about Ding? How he got also to the candidates was just simply ridiculous, right? Well, yeah. Okay, so, um, I mean, we can sum it up with one very clutch game at the end. He beat Tikar with, with White in the yeah. last round. Super clutch. At that point, he knew 
well, maybe he didn't know that this will matter. He probably didn't. That I mean, nobody knew for sure. Yeah. But this is his only chance. It's like, I mean, even if you have like a 20% chance that second place is enough, still that's 20%. So he won a very clutch game against Hikaru. It was a good game. Um, Hikaru, I'm sure, was kicking himself after that game because he missed a golden opportunity to, to play a match. But he was also mentioning during one of his uh, streams that he believes that if if he would have qualified, if he would have taken second place, Magnus would have played the match. Do you think that's uh, that's the case? I, I don't believe that at all. I think Magnus took his decision based on what he wants to do. That's it. You know, he's uh, he's not making his life choices based on on uh, other people. I mean, if he wants to play a match, he plays a match. If he doesn't, he doesn't. We weren't sure if if that's the case or not, and we can debate about whether he, you know, I articulated think he the match. You think he you, would have played the match? You think so? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I I like strongly disagree with this. I don't think he would play just to stick it to Hikaru. I mean, he doesn't care that much. <laughs> yes. Like, you're gonna yes. sacrifice six just months. Just stick it to Hikaru. No, I, I don't believe that at all. Really? I don't buy that. Like, I mean, I, you know, they might not be the best of friends, but that's about it. I don't think it's just about that. I also think it's some sort of a competition between them, uh, between their fans as well. I know there is a lot of clashes in the chat. Every single chat that you're watching whenever uh, they, they, they play against each other, uh, there's going to be a lot of clashes. Now, at the same time, Hikaru kind of has established himself as a very popular streamer and he amassed a lot of following and whatnot. And I think Magnus sees that, of course, Magnus uh, being the world champion, uh, he has amassed uh, a big following as well, a big legion of fans. But at the same time, I feel like there's a competition uh, in that realm as well. And he wouldn't be um, willing to give up a match to Hikaru because obviously a match brings a lot of attention to you. Uh, gives you new fans, uh, new perspectives and whatnot. I don't... I don't even want to dabble into the money situation, right? But I do think that Magnus would just not be able to sit at home and watch Hikaru, watch his fans pretty much uh, gather all that attention. No, I mean, we, like, there's no debate that a match for Hikaru would be more beneficial for him than a match for, let's say, Ding is for Absolutely. him. Absolutely, yeah. Because Hikaru can capitalize on this great following that he's amassed and he's put a lot of work into that and he's the best and most popular chess streamer in the world. And he's bigger than Magnus as a as a chess promoter and entertainer because he's put those hours in mm. and he's built his brand. And Magnus could have done that. It's just not his interest. You know, he could have been streaming every day and he would have built up a uh, an online presence that's bigger than Hikaru's. But, but I think Magnus, uh, to his defense, he decided to go against that because he's trying to build his audience through his platforms through Chess24, through the Play Magnus group, um, Chessable, and pretty much all of these uh, chess institutions, right, that are under his wing. And I think this is his response to Hikaru's uh, popularity. Well, I don't think it has any... Because, you know, he, like, he bought Chess24 in 20... I think it was 18 or 17. Something like that. This yeah. was before the whole online chess boom. This is before Hikaru was huge on Twitch. Yeah. There was, you know, there were chess players on Twitch. Chess he was brought. warming up. He was definitely but warming up. This was this was purely a business decision. Yeah. He he was not looking at it as I need to like amass the biggest online following. And for him it's like the way I see it is <clears throat> he loves chess and he loves being the best at chess. Mm -hmm. Um and he I'm sure he loves working on chess. I don't think he would love streaming every day like a full-time job the way that he, no, he would enjoys it. it but and chess 24 it's a platform that is run by people besides him it's his platform you know but he he doesn't do the day-to-day -day operations Absolutely. on that yeah so it's other people who do that work and he focuses on on the chess so he uses his henchmen to basically <laughs> fight hikaru's popularity well i don't think it ha really has anything to do with hikaru like i don't think he sees hikaru as a direct rival you know mm. It's so like they're in they're in somewhat different realms of the, of the same world. Hikaru has cornered the chess entertainment individual chess entertainment platform because of course there are these mega sites like chess.com, like chess24, yeah. Like the St. Louis Chess Club that promote chess as an organization and Hikaru as the the biggest individual um chess promoter, let's say. Um and Magnus, he's the the best chess player. 
Uh, these are just these are two different realms. Mm. Uh, so I, I don't think that he conflates the two. I think he just wants to be recognized as the best chess player in the world, and and he wants to keep on being the best. So he puts his work into chess, into his chess performance. Um, and I mean, we can only speculate on whether he would play. Like Hikaru will say, he wouldn't. Uh, he wouldn't let him play a match. Yeah. Um, that could also just be his way of, you know, not being like too heartbroken. That over makes the fact, sense. Yeah. You know, I, I, a coping mechanism. Yeah, for we, him as well. I mean, we also need that, right? Yeah. Because it can be very painful to lose. Oh, it's. it's um, and for sure, I would be like kicking myself if, uh, if I was in that direct position, because I was, I was in that position, but not directly. It wasn't like one game. It was like I had to play seven games well to get second place, right? Yeah. Well, for him, it was just one draw at the end. Uh, so he was closer objectively than I was. Uh, and, and yeah, going back to Ding, of course, it's it's remarkable. It's like, because he's only he only played the candidates because of the war. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can call it a war, the invasion right. of uh, Russia and Ukraine. Like, otherwise, Sergei would not have said all this stuff. Um, he wouldn't have been banned by the ethics commission. A spot wouldn't have opened up, and Ding, who didn't try to qualify, wouldn't have qualified. Like Ding didn't play the World Cup, Grand Prix, or, or Grand Prix. Those were the three qualification routes, which you know, for example, like Wesley played, Levon played, Maxime played. Probably they, because he was having like huge problems getting out of China. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know the situation, but he either decided it's not worth it. Or he was just physically un- incapable of leaving the country. I suspect he decided it wasn't worth it because mm-hmm. we saw some Chinese players playing, like um, Yu Yang Yi. Yu Yang Yi was played. Playing. He Wang pl- Hao. Was Wang Hao playing? He played the Grand Prix, right? Wang Hao. I Grand didn't... Swiss. Never mind. No, I always no. He didn't. Those. He didn't play the Grand Swiss. He did not play. The he Grand didn't. Swiss. Well, mm. I, I don't remember if he was in the cycle at all because I, I don't think so because he announced his retirement. Oh yeah. Wang but but Yu Yang Yi yeah. was definitely in the uh, in the Grand Prix and in the Grand Swiss. Mm-hmm. I remember him there. I don't know if he was in the World Cup. Yeah. But yeah, a lot of players tried, and you know, it's it's a tough uh, tough qualification process. A lot of players didn't make it. So um, so yeah, he was probably thinking, well, this is not my cycle to make. I'll try to make the next one. Um, but then he got this, you know, golden <laughs> opportunity. He plays a bunch of games, and and by rating, he qualifies. Uh, so yeah, that was a remarkable opportunity for him to play, and then, and then he gets another like th- this. I mean, I don't want to talk about luck, but for him, let's let's talk about <laughs> luck a little bit. Like that was that was definitely a bit lucky. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I I felt like that spot opened up, and I felt like that's probably going to go to Ding, and then the next day he started this cycle of playing four games uh, a day or like two games a day for like four weeks. And uh, amass like whatever he needed, thirty six games or something like that to I make it. I think it was twenty eight games. It was just something ridiculous. Yeah, it was a lot of games and in, compiled into one month. He played yeah. like one month of uh, nonstop chess uh, against his compatriots, and uh, <laughs> and yeah, he gained like five rating points. He didn't need to gain rating, but he basically kept his rating, which is what he needed. Um, he basically just didn't have to drop below. I think it was like 27, 2760, something like that. 27, I don't know, yeah, because Levon was like 2785 or something. But it was uh, some sort of a formula, right? Yeah, maybe it was. And I don't but think that one counted. He, it, was, it was pretty much in the bag unless he like yeah. did very badly. Um, now, okay, like FIDE for me, they just like that process doesn't make any sense. If you don't have a rating spot, um, then you shouldn't have a rating spot as the backup. Yeah. You know, uh, like if someone drops out, then it should go to third place World Cup. Mm. Which was Fedo save, third place um, Grand Switch, Grand Switch, which was Oparin, mm. third place. My student, like, yeah, yeah, your student. <laughs> he would have been candidate. No, I mean we can debate about whether these are this. Of course, Ding is like heads and shoulders stronger than than um, most of the players who would have qualified via these means, and uh, Ding is like you know, it fully belongs in the candidates, right? If he makes it, then he's there, um, and he's as strong as anyone there, but. Uh, but for me, like just for the cohesiveness of the of the qualification mm-hmm, process, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you shouldn't like suddenly just throw rating in there. It should be either you have a rating spot, and that's either your backup, or you have no rating spot and that's not your backup. And the backup goes to third place Grand Prix, for example. I don't know who that was. Maybe it was Wesley, mm-hmm. who would also make sense in the candidates, right? Wesley fully 
fully make sense in the candidates. And wasn't there some sort of a situation very similar to that in 2020 when uh, it was Maxine. What's, uh, Alexenko qualified? Yeah, well, uh, so that was a wild card. Ah, that was a wild card. Alexenko was a wild card. Yeah. But they took him because he basically took second so place. This is actually in the Grand a funny Swiss. story. Um, no, so uh, the Grand Swiss was first place was Wang Hao. He yeah. qualifies. I got second place. I was already qualified being the challenge, the previous challenger. Um, so uh, set the the second place didn't matter. Um, and he got third place. Right? But the wild card had to be. Um, so the wild card was going to be a Russian because mm. it was held in Russia. It was held in Russia. So yeah. the Russian sponsor would pick a Russian wild card. That means that normally it would go to Sergei Karyakin because he was, or, or Alexander Grishik maybe, right. the highest rated Russian players. But it had to be someone who got third place. And I think it was either Grand Swiss or, or the World Cup or something. And none of these players made it. The only available option was Alexenko. So he got, um, I can't remember the place. Maybe it wasn't third place, but it was some place that was necessary, like requirement according to regulations. I think it was third. To be eligible for... He beat Grishuk in the last round. Um, he? N- no, he actually beat Karyakin in the last round. Karyakin, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It was um, it was a weird opening. And I guess they both felt they needed to win. So Karyakin plays Knight of Three first move. They sacrificed... Uh, one of them sacrificed a piece. Yeah, Karyakin did. It was Karyakin, it was a kind yeah. of crazy game. Karyakin starts with Knight of Three. Alexenko responds first move D5. G3. And then he plays this weird Knight D7 move. Yeah. Totally oh, like... Yeah. Totally unknown that. stuff. Um... So yeah, there's always like some kind of weird thing that happens. Also like, you know, Rajabov dropping out, that was kind of weird in the last candidates. Unexpected and at least... But overall, this candidates went a lot smoother, <laughs> smoother than the last one because at least this one was finished in one go and not over the course of a full year. Yeah. All right, let's talk about some uh, more hot topics. Um, what just finished uh, the Olympiad, right? That's uh, That was a big one. You were coming off the candidates. Um, you had like what two weeks to uh, rest before yeah. the Olympiad? I played the Bundesliga. I just wanted. I to, did. You yeah. did play the Bundesliga. You played against Hans, I think, and you yeah. won. You won against Hans with the black pieces. And Actually, there's there's game, a player right? who's pretty hot now. Oh yeah, Hans for sure. Yeah, <laughs> we'll talk about him in yep. just a second. But let's uh, l- let's chat about the Olympiad. So, what did you do in between the candidates and the Olympiad? Were you still in? You were still in Europe, right? Yeah, I stayed in Europe. Because it, it was it's quite a trip to go from the U.S. to India to Chennai in this case, I mean that that's a really long trip. That's yeah. like two ten-hour flights at a minimum, and so I decided I'll stay in Europe and have a slightly easier trip and kind of chill. And you I, didn't play Croatia, no, because I played in Warsaw. We're talking about the Grand Chess Tour. Grand Chess Tour, right? yeah, yeah. So I, I played in Warsaw. I skipped Croatia. Um, yeah, I decided just to relax. I didn't really look at any chess mm. um, because I was a bit burnt out and. Didn't really feel like looking at chess. And then played the Olympiad, yeah. And probably you had some residual openings from the Candice preparation as well. Now yeah. we got to India. Uh, how would you assess India? Did you like it? How was India for you? Well, I, I mean, the tournament was organized as well as could have been, I think. Um, it's still difficult. You know, like the climate and, uh, and the food and the water and things are a bit maybe difficult for for people who aren't from India to adapt to um yeah we were by the by the beach which was nice I got to swim in the ocean yeah. and it was sort of in a resort setting um the downside was one of the nice things about the Olympiad is you see people from all over the world and you get to hang out with you know your friends who you don't see so often and in India we were kind of all separated in different hotels rather far apart like mm-hmm. let's say if I want to see like the chess bras, right? But our hotels are like 30 minutes apart and you want to like hang out with your team as well. So after the games, it was mostly I was hanging out with my team and I didn't really see people outside of the US teams. You're you're also mentioning this to me. It, it was extremely difficult to get out of the hotel, right? Uh, what was the process for that? Did well, you have to get authorization or something like that? Well, it, it depends. I think for women, it was a bit more difficult because mm-hmm. they were a bit worried uh, that, you know, it might not be entirely safe for a woman to travel alone. So I think you, women were told, like, you should be accompanied by uh, a policeman or a security guard or some someone to make sure that nothing weird happens. And I, I, I don't think that anything would happen, but I guess they were taking all possible precautions because that would look 
I find this pretty pretty cool for uh, from their perspective, right? To do that and to make sure that everything runs smoothly and nobody uh, gets in trouble, yeah. pretty much. Well, they had like a, a million volunteers and yeah. people working there. It was like you go to the airport and you're you already like greeted by twenty volunteers. Um, but like I left the hotel once, and taking a taxi was tough. It That's was, what I remember from uh, Georgia when I played. I think it was Batumi 2018. 2018, yep. Uh, that was the most difficult part of it. Just finding a taxi, first of all, because uh, the shuttles were leaving a bit too early. I mm -hmm. think it was like one hour before the round, and we didn't really want to go there and just have to wait another 30 minutes. So we were mostly taking taxis, but sometimes you were just like finding this ridiculous traffic oh, yeah. um, going in into the competition hall. And also, obviously, some of the taxis were just really, really bad. <laughs> Yeah, I, I took a taxi once there, and the guy was, I was like, praying that I'll make it. Yes, yes. He was going against traffic. <laughs> yes, yes. And, like, just going crazy, just trying to avoid anything. He, like, he took a way that was just purely against traffic. It was This is, like, 100% illegal to drive through this way. Just because there was, like, a backup for, like, two blocks, and he probably didn't want to, to wait 15 minutes. Yeah. I mean, in the U.S., you just put the meter on, <laughs> and you enjoy your extra whatever. But, um... I kind of appreciated it. Like, okay, you really want to get me to, to where to I'm going. Do, yeah. Yeah. In, in the fastest time. Uh, but in India, it was different. Like it was, there was no traffic. Mm. Um, when I, when I, uh, from what I saw. But, but it's a bit crazy, right? Did they have uh, some sort of like, a, how do they call it? Like a green, green something, green corridor. Well, for like chess I think they had, they had special corridors open maybe, but, um, also we were in like, we weren't really in the city. We were mm. kind of remote. We were in like resort areas and places closer, closer to the coast. And so I think we were avoid, avoiding the main traffic. Um, how far was the plane home from depends from us? It was about 10 minutes, which 10 was minutes. very convenient. Um, but for some people it was like half an hour, which is kind of annoying because you have to leave quite significantly earlier to make sure that you, you don't lose the game and the match and everything at the same time. That's pretty much every single Olympiad. Usually, yeah. yeah. Like, uh, well, my first Olympiad in Dresden, we had to travel an hour every day. Yeah. And that was pretty rough. Uh, but there were also people like right next to the plane hall who just walked across their hotel, their hotels there and the plane halls there. Um, but yeah, getting back to Chennai, it was, getting a taxi was tough because there was like so much paperwork. It's like you order a taxi and then, first of all, like 10 people arrange this. And then you have to like fill out forms, mm. and was this was there somebody in your uh, team or uh, in the U.S. delegation that was handling everything? Uh, well, we, I mean, our captain was handling some logistical stuff, but um, also I think, um, yeah, I think John J.D. Uh, John Dawson, our captain, was handling most of the logistical stuff. Also, I think Robert Hess, our Robert coach, Hess, took yeah. took some of the burden of that because there's quite a lot of things to handle. And for one guy, it might be kind of difficult to, to arrange it all. Um, but yeah, I mean, overall, aside from our performance, it was a relatively enjoyable Olympiad. Um, yeah, I mean, we were such, mm -hmm. if we had performed decently well, we would have done very well, but just didn't work out at all. Yeah, it, it, it felt that way, right? Because going into the event, I think you guys were something along the lines of like 70 rating points uh, favorites, right? Over the next one, which I think it was India. Yeah. Um, when did you feel like things are just not going your way? Well, like personally, from the very first game I played, I was like, something is off with my play. Yeah. I, it was just very strange. It was like, First round, I'm white. I'm playing someone who I'm normally a heavy favorite against, and I'm just playing the most, like, cowardly chess. Who was that against? We were playing against Paraguay. So I was playing Paraguay. a very good player, Bachmann. Axel Bachman. Yeah. A really talented guy. Um, he used to be close to 2,700, I think. Yeah, he was, I think he was high 2,600s. Yeah. I mean, he, he kind of retired or semi-retired and, and lost a lot of his rating. Hey, he's still a very good player. But normally speaking with white, I should at least be putting heavy pressure on him. And, and it just didn't, like, I mean, I was slightly worse with white at some I point. I remember that, yeah. It was just a kind of, at some point I was like, this is so sad. It's not even that I'm, like, seriously worse or I'm in danger of losing necessarily, but 
I'm 20 minutes into the game and I'm already like no chances to win. And that also looks bad for the rest of the team because they're like looking at the first board and you expect at least... You're the leader of the team. You have to... Yeah, especially with white, right? You expect some like Give some good stuff some to direction. go on with the whites and, and the blacks played solidly. Yeah. Um. So yeah, and then that just like continued and continued and at the end I gained a bit of momentum. I started to play a few decent games in the last two, three rounds. Um, but overall, and you know, our best performer was Wesley. Mm-hmm. He played his level, which is a very high level, and he didn't lose any games, and he won a bunch. Um, but he was the only one who was in shape. And and it wasn't even like he was in the best shape of, shape of his life. He was just at his normal good level. But the rest of us were just struggling a lot. And even so, even with you guys struggling, I still felt all the way until the match with Armenia, I think, uh, that you were within contention. You were within striking distance to actually win the tournament. That game, that match with Armenia, obviously you had some problems as well. And then uh, Sam Shanklin, the last, in the last few seconds, right, uh, a draw would have won the match. Well, this was a crazy match because, um, yeah, I mean, I take a lot of blame for this match because I had a good position against uh, Gabi Sergisian. You were Sergisian. white or black? I was black. You were black. But I had an excellent position and it was very safe. I had plenty of time and it was at least a solid advantage. Maybe not a big one. Um, if I'd played like very accurate, accurately, it could have turned into a big one. But this is like a risk-free edge. And then I just started to make mistake after mistake and like everything fell apart. Once I got worse, I didn't defend at all. And that was sort of the theme of my tournament mm. is that once I was getting worse, my defensive skills were non-existent. And so that was one problem uh, and, a, and a major one. Because if I had drawn that game, I think... Um, or or won that game, then we would have won the match. That's just that's just it. Because um, it was like Wesley had a crazy game on board two. He was basically lost out of the opening, and then it went from lost to game over, like he's winning in one move. His opponent made one move in the opening, and it went from he's basically winning to Wesley wins instantly. And this was just shocking. I mean, it was also a really beautiful tactic. Like with the queen sacrifice and mate with the king all going to f3, black's king going to f3, in the middle yeah, game. Yeah, I remember that. Just um, really beautiful tactic. So takes c4. Yeah. At that moment, I was super happy because I see he's winning. Like he's a hundred percent going to win after after he played rook takes e 4 I have a good position. Everything looks fine. I mean, Sam is in a complicated position at that point. Dominguez was winning as well at that point, right? Or was it? Well, Lenier won. Lenier won. Lenier right? won the game. He yeah. won with black. He had a good position out of the opening, but it looked like a mess. So let's say that one was hard to judge. But um, but yeah, uh, we're winning or better, totally winning one game. Lanier looks like he has a good position. I have a good position. Sam is unclear. I lose. Lanier starts to win, which is a good thing. Uh, and then Sam is good. Like his game is going downhill. Um, but then like out of miraculously, he's about to draw the game. And were you still at the playing hole at that point? Or no, no, I went or back. Or so we were watching the game uh, with the team. And in somebody's room? Like, what was uh, the setup? I can't even remember whose room we were in. But somebody's room. We were in someone's room. We were watching the game in a group. And and each moment it was like, he's losing. <laughs> the oh, he's drawing. Like it's this, it's yeah. like, they were in time trouble, so I understand. Like, um, And then suddenly it's like, the game is about to be over. He's... It's queen, pawn, and bishop. His opponent has that against queen, two pawns, and king. And he's about to eliminate black's last pawn. And queen against queen and bishop is, is just a draw. It's a draw, yeah. There's not much there. Yeah. Um, and Sam has about two minutes left with increment. Plenty of time. And the guy moves his queen. And Sam just touched, like, instantly grabs his king. And, like, we didn't even know at the time because we just saw, like, the guy moves his queen and then it showed 0-1. And it's like, boy. so you weren't watching the video. No, we were watching like the just the, video the just the board, just the board. And it was like this doesn't make any sense. Did he lose on time? And so then we like tune into the feed, and the commentators are also like, what what just happened? And then we see that yeah, Sam thought he was going to give a check, and then his king move was forced. But instead, his his opponent didn't give a check. He moved the queen just one square away from the check. But the guy hadn't like released the queen on the square yet, so basically Sam pre-moved. Yeah, yeah, yeah over yeah. the board. Yeah. <laughs> and 
and he had plenty of time. I think this was just like a lot of emotions. He was like losing, losing, that losing, and then he was excited. He's about to draw, and then he just like didn't adjust to the like he didn't you know slow down, take a moment to adjust to the new situation, and just calmly make his moves and make a draw. So that was like. What a weird way to, to, to not win that match. What are the usual feelings you get whenever you're in those type of situations? Like, you know the result, uh, the natural result of the game and what would that accomplish uh, for the team? What are the emotions at that point? I mean, I can't say I was happy at, at all. Like, I thought, okay, we're about to win the match and that's good. But I can't say I was happy because I'm still playing like shit. Right. And I'm gonna, I lost my game and the whole tournament has been a disaster for me. And I can't like distance myself completely from my personal results. Of course, personally, even I mean, though you're lo losing so many rating points at that level, yeah, they're so difficult. But to also, gain like back. playing so badly, it doesn't make you happy. And even if the team, the team would have been doing well uh, if we had won that, um, still doesn't like feel great from a personal point of view. But at least it's something. At yeah. least it like gives you motivation. Like, okay, let's keep going. Try to stop the bleeding personally so that the team can do well. Um, and but yeah, once it's like once everything's going wrong, you're like just, you know, there's not much hope. Even, even if I somehow pull it together, and that's not clear that it will happen, we're still not really in contention for anything. It seems, or, or maybe we were even in the last round. Like maybe we we had a chance that it it did feel well, okay if we had won the match. Very unlikely, right? If we you had won guys the match. have to win the match, but everybody all the results have to go your way. Basically, well, for bronze, not everything had to go our way. For bronze, yes. Yeah. And that would have been but something. For gold. No, for gold, it was like, like... I think you were still... In God would have to come down from heaven <laughs> right. and stop those bullets <laughs> for us to make gold. Like, we weren't thinking about that. But for bronze, we were thinking, okay, we have a shot at this, and it's something. Like, yeah, it's course. a medal. Of course. Um, if we had won that match, but we didn't win the match, it was close. We, we maybe had some chances to win it. But finally, the last match was a draw. Uh, even if we had won, we wouldn't have made it because the other things didn't go in our favor. But yeah, overall, pretty huge disappointment for us. Absolutely. Uh, now let's get back to more recent topics as well and uh, happier times. Um, FTX Crypto Cup just finished. We're recording this uh, podcast on August 21st, I think is today. Yep. Magnus just won the FTX Crypto Cup. Prague did really well, second yeah. place. I mean, that was just ridiculous. He started yeah, super off Super impressive. With I think, was it four match victories? Or was um, it three match maybe victories? Maybe it was three and he lost the fourth. He kind of... No, I think it was four. Maybe it was four. I, think I don't remember four. exactly. I think it was four and then he lost the fifth one. And did he lose a six as well? And then he beat Magnus in the last one? But this last one was really impressive because he was down in the match. And then he beats Magnus on demand and wins a tiebreak. That's like... To get second place. Yeah, it wasn't enough. Once they made but tie still. breaks, we already knew that Magnus is winning tournament yeah. by points. Yeah, yeah. But still, Pragnanda was... But still, I mean, it's not just about first or second place, but to beat Magnus in a match, pretty impressive feat. And uh, and uh, as a personal accomplishment for a young player is also great. It does feel like he's a bit in the shadows of, let's say, Gukesh. Obviously, Gukesh during the Olympiad was just ridiculous. Uh, Eric Icy also. It felt like Pragananda, I remember him maybe four or five years ago when uh, he came at uh, St. Louis Chess Club, uh, one of those um, millennials events, I think it was mm -hmm. called. And he was really making waves at that time. And then he slowed down a little bit, or at least it feels like he slowed down a little bit. He's right now 2650 along those lines. And then you have the guys like Gukesh right now, live rating 27. Uh, 30, I think a bit less because he just lost the last couple of rounds at the um, Turkish League, Turkish Super League. Uh, but still, there's a ridiculous amount of talent in India. The crop of, uh, of players coming up from the new generation is just off the charts. Now, how do you see this race between Pragnanda, Gukesh, Erigaisi, and so on? Who's going to uh, take the cherry? Well, it's possible it's not just one of them, of course. Um, I don't think that all of them will be top players. And also, we have to include Nihal Sarin. Nihal, in exactly. That, in that group. Yeah. Also around like 26, 60 or so. Yeah. A bit less than Gukesh. Well, and I quite think a bit less than 16 also. Right? Yeah, I think he's around the same age as Pragnanta. Mm. 
Um, he's like very known for his blitz and rapid prowess. Um, super good, super talented. He's been playing matches against like, you know, Wesley and taking them basically to the down to the wire um, in blitz and rapid. So definitely a great player as well. Uh, but I think it's it's just difficult to judge with these young players because sometimes like everyone has their their own individual progress and sometimes people like rush to you know like the great heights nearly the world's top like Gukesh is doing now and then they slow down and then some players kind of take a more sporadic uh, you know a slower approach and then they make like a, a big big jump to the top level like let's say Levon Aronian is one of those players who you know he made his jump to the top when he was I think in his 20s right mm -hmm. uh, which seems very late now but um but yeah, it's hard to say. Like Wei Yi is an example. He's a well, he is sort of a top player and he's super, really strong. But he was like 27 30 at like the age of 15, 16. Exactly. Yeah. And then he's basically the same rating now, which is like, you know, 10 years later. So hard to say, of course. I mean, some of them will be top players from from that crop that you mentioned and Ni Hasarin. One of those guys will be a top player, a, a genuine top player. One of them will probably even at some point be world champion like you have good odds considering there's a lot of good players there but all of them and which ones all right well we're playing the stock market right now and these guys are your potential picks who are you going to put your money on to uh, make it 2800 let's not say world champion 2800 i would probably how many can i pick or what can one. i put them in like an order if sure. i yes if I had to pick one, but one big horse. I if I had to win, pick horse. one, maybe I'd pick Eric Aisi. Eric Aisi. I'm, I might like go out on a limb there, pick one of the older guys. Oh, huh. because his chess is incredible. Um, if I had to pick like them in order, I would probably go Eric Aisi, Pragnanta, Gukesh, and Nihal Sarin in that order. But Gukesh is the highest rated right now. Yeah, but you don't feel he has confirmed yet. It's, you know, huge Olympiad, tremendous huge Olympiad. Olympiad. Ridiculous, yeah. But one event, I, I just don't want to like put too much weight on one event. It's like the hot streak is a bit too hot. You want to see more of that like consistent mm -hmm. level, mm -hmm. which he, he might show. But I, I just wouldn't put too much weight into one event. It's just too like, think chess is too volatile. Mm -hmm. Things can always, there's normal ups and downs. And um, with like Eric Aisi, we've seen already for like the last year, you know, he's shown his constant level, little incremental improvements. Um, with Prognanta, it's just the way he plays against top players in like rapid and blitz matches is so impressive that, you know, he has the like enormous potential there. Um, I think he recently uh, said that he feels he's underrated in classical chess. Do you feel the same way? I don't know exactly his rating. Is it? Uh, it's hard to say as well. Um, like I definitely think his rating. Will I think improve. he's around twenty six seventy after a few games at the Olympiad. I think his rating will definitely improve. In that sense, I guess he's underrated. But I mean, what what does that mean underrated? Like I wouldn't say he's a top player, um, but he might be someday soon. You know. Absolutely. FTX Crypto Cup. Magnus winning Pragnanda second. But one of the big moments of, uh, of of the tournament was, of course, the interview of uh, Hans Niemann. Yeah, the chess speaks for itself moment. Uh, we were watching it. We were here. We were laughing uh, our butts off. Um, but then he went on and lost all his matches. Like, what? what, what? Um, I guess. <laughs> How the, do you see that moment? I guess the chess spoke for itself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I you know, I, I think Hans is great. Um, he's really entertaining. Um, he he has a he has a fun personality. He has a lot of charisma. Um, the thing is, like from experience, after you win one game, that's not the moment to like <laughs> to Especially like start saying situation. stuff. Yeah, in a match situation, yeah. you at least wait until the match is over. Um, and the the comment itself is great. I mean, the meme will live forever. Mm -hmm. uh, it would have been better for him if he had actually won that match rather than losing the next three games against Magnus. Uh, you could say like th this is a thing that you should, you know, wait until after you win the match to say because it looks a bit um, it looks a bit funny if you say it and then and then you don't win the match. 
And he could have suspected that it's not going to be so easy to walk all over Magnus just because he wins the first game, right? Especially in these matches, I think, like, comebacks are so likely, so commonplace. Um, but still, it's a great meme. Uh, he's going to have to deal with a lot of trolling now, <laughs> for sure. Especially considering that the other matches didn't exactly go in his favor either. I love it. Uh, now, do you think he actually prepared this beforehand? Do you think he... Uh plot it at night before the event started okay what's uh what's a good one liner i can throw in if i beat magnus i think he definitely had it planned but i think he probably had a plan for if he wins a match <laughs> but then he got ahead of himself he got a bit overexcited <laughs> you know he he um he came in with that too early it happens but uh yeah it's um it's still a great line but yeah th this was definitely something he had planned and also the walk off camera ignoring the reporter's question and the guy's like <laughs> Hands, Hands. <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> please <go>. answer me. <laughs> Don't go. No, that was just insane. I mean, I was uh, laughing my ass off and we were here enjoying the moment. Now, uh, the, the problem with that, as you mentioned, is that if you don't win, you have to deal with the trolls. But um, the flip side of the coin is that I do feel like you have to take some risks occasionally and you just have to, even if it doesn't go your way, you still have the one liner that's going to live forever and nobody else is going to be able to steal that uh, from you. You can still sell a million shirts <laughs> with chess speaks for itself. I'm uh, sure everybody, you will have a good game uh, at the, the Singfield Cup, let's say, and yeah. you're going to be like, yeah, the chess. You always uh, have a few good games here and there. The chess speaks for itself. <laughs> but I think this is like, so we were like, we saw Mike Tyson recently, right? And yeah. his old interviews. Yeah. And like he gave the greatest interviews, but he was also the greatest champion. Yeah. And... It has a lot, a very different impact. When you say some crazy stuff, like I've got tiger's blood and I'm the, <laughs> I'm the greatest and there's yeah. nobody as vicious and ferocious as me. <laughs> right, right. And it has a different impact when you actually prove it rather than when you're just saying it and hoping that the results follow up. So I think it's great to say that, especially if you have the confidence to back it up. And you take a risk on that, you know, but history judges these things. Absolutely. No, it, and the next I, I think the next few uh, tournaments are going to be crucial for him uh, just because if he manages to pull together and let's say string a couple of uh, good tournaments uh, get over 2700 and kind of confirm the fact because the guy was like 2450 two years ago yeah um, his rise was just simply ridiculous and now he's close to 2700 mm -hmm. one of the most hyped up players right if he manages to confirm that I feel uh, you know it's going to speak for itself, basically. Yeah, I mean, the guy has, with confidence, and I think he has passion for the game, he's gotten pretty far. He's made a lot of improvements. Uh, I don't know if I would, like, bet on him becoming a future world champion. Mm. I would more likely bet on him being one of those, like, sporadically very successful players who's a bit uneven, uh, which is also, like, you can get far with that, too. You don't have to have complete consistency to make a great chess career. But that, uh, I mean, we'll see. He's still really young, like... He doesn't look it, but he's like 19. That's that's so young. That's like the start of your career. I mean, nobody really has big successes before that age. Like when I was 19, yeah, I mean, I won a tournament here and there, but nothing, nothing really major. Uh, even like Mag when Magnus was 19 and he was, you know, one of the best in the world. Yeah, he had won a few tournaments, but major successes, they come a bit later into your early or mid 20s yeah and he definitely needs to be able to uh, shrug this uh let's say bad event off right you you said the one liner but unfortunately for you, you lost all your matches after that that must take uh, a toll on you right and you have to be able to shrug it off but the way i i i don't know hans as well but from what i know about him and uh, i met him a couple of times from what I've seen, I think he is quite strong mentally in that regard. So I'm definitely looking forward to see him at the, the U.S. Champs. I think that's the next big one that's going to be in October. And I'm sure we're going to be talking about that as well. And that's one where you give interviews after every game. Exactly. So yeah. there will be a lot of fruitful opportunities there. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's an exciting one. And uh, yeah, we'll leave it at that because... We'll be back next week. This is going to be a weekly podcast, or at least that's the plan for uh, the moment right now. Um, what's coming up for you right now? What tournaments do you have? Well, the St. Louis Rapid and Blitz starts pretty soon. I'm also thinking about trying to qualify for this Chess 960 World Championship. Uh, there's a lot of online qualifiers. I have like my reservations with those because a lot of money is on the line, and I don't know how much you can like 
weed out potential unfair play. Mm. So I, I definitely have my um, my reservations about playing a huge online qualifier with everyone playing with a lot of money on the line, a big qualification spot for 450 grand in prizes in the final, final eight players. Um, I'm a bit worried, but I still might give it a shot. We'll leave it at that. That was a lot of fun. Uh, we'll be back next week with the second episode of uh, Chess Podcast. Until next time.